Willys is a hidden gem and unexpected surprise. They make incredible boots and shoes the old school way, like few others do. I don't know whether you know this, but in the French tradition, uh, old school French guys, like the insult that they would use to yell at other cooks if they didn't like their work, said, what are you, a shoemaker? You, yeah. I'm gonna start using that. What are you, a cook? <laughs>
Cheers. So guys, first of all, I noticed your host earlier said cheers. In Scotland, we say slanjava. It means good health. Let's try it. Slanjava. Slanjava. Come on, better than that. Slanjava. Yes, slanjava. good stuff. Slanjava. My God, they're drinking too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That's a little frightening. Okay. It's wonderful. It's so the, It's got a great taste. It's beautiful. The, the whiskey you have in front of you guys is the Balvenie 12 year old double wood. Now double wood actually means two different casks. It's 12 years in an American oak bourbon cask and then six months in a sherry cask. What we had here though, it's kind of cool, I just brought this for fun, it's called a copper dog or a dipping dog. A copper dog? Yep, now in the, in the old days, probably still to this day actually, the distillery workers used to relieve the casks of some whiskey, just to, purely for research, and they would use this, so they would take it in, they would dip it in the cask, fill it up, and then it went down the trousers and home, and that's how they stole the whiskey. They took it home. There was one guy who worked at the distillery for 20 years. He thought he'd a limp, <laughs> but he was stealing whiskey. So it's, it's, it's a copper dog for relieving the cast of whiskey. But we're very proud to be here, and the reason we work with Tony, we're very proud to work with Tony, is the Balvenie is the most handcrafted, we believe the most handcrafted single malt. We still practice the five crafts of whiskey making. In other words, we make it the way it was made 120 years ago. We grow the barley ourselves, we malt it ourselves. We have a coppersmith, Dennis, who's been there since 1959. He used to make these. Uh, we have a cooperage where they make the casks, and Tony's been there. And as you know, the wood's the most important part in making the whiskey. And our malt master, David Stewart, has been there since 1962. So we're very proud of the fact that we're still in the same family and we're made by hand. And we've been celebrating craftsmanship across the US since for the last five years. And we've been very fortunate to partner with Tony for the last two years. Uh, we went around celebrating craftsmen and women who made things by hand with passion, the way we make our whiskey. So we're very proud of that. And this has culminated in this series of great, great interviews and films and highlighting these craftspeople, which Tony has kindly agreed to do with us. Anthony, uh, we were talking about music backstage and music that you love, and you're a very well-known uh, sort of, uh, you love punk rock from the, from the mid-70s, late-70s, New York punk particularly, I would say, um, which in many ways lends itself to an authenticity argument, you know, the most authentic version of music or of, of punk yeah. rock. When do you think that started translating into an idea of the authenticity behind food, the authenticity behind sort of craftsmen that you started to uncover, and then having your shows where you were discovering the sort of authentic cuisines of different cities and countries? Yeah, it's a difficult term. It's becoming more meaningless in a lot of ways uh, when it comes to food because, you know, when you're talking about authentic Italian, well, do you mean before the tomato arrived from the New World? Uh, you know, the tomato is not an original Italian ingredient. Uh, when you talk about original Singaporean, then it starts to get really tricky because this is a mix of cultures and ethnicities. People have been intermarrying and cooking together for years. So um, when it comes to food, it, it's tricky. I, For me, um, particularly now, I don't like to use the term much until you kind of mess with a thing about which I have very rigid concepts. Like I'm, I'm a snob about pastas, you know. There's one way to make a, a real carbonara or an amatriciana. These, you don't want to mess with those recipes. And I guess when we're talking about crafts as well, um, it, you know, at least honor the original old school way before you start moving on and fusing and blending with the rest. But I think it's a more of an attitude thing. I think it's, are you going to take the extra step? Are you going to work extra hard to make it as well as you possibly can? And even if you're not making it the way, the old school way that the old masters did, at least you should know how to do that and, and, and have some respect for how it was done. Yeah, I guess I'm using uh, the word authenticity in a, with a loose definition and, and meaning more of the <laughs> yeah. sense of like uh, raw craft, meaning more of the sense of like someone who really worked and put time into this and it represents, you know, maybe not the sort of all the way back to the early age of their city or their country, right. but it represents something but, but truly unique But I think in a lot of theirs. cases here, I mean, when, when uh, Frank Shattuck made, made a suit for me, I mean, he brought his, his mentor, this, uh, you know, this old Spanish dude, uh, <laughs> you know, it, you know in to, to supervise the final, uh, the final fitting. You know, it was important to him that, that his master, even though you know, he's been doing it alone for a very, very long time, that his, his master, uh, you know, gave a seal of approval and saw that he was doing okay. I, you know, I admire that. Uh, absolutely, and that is, a, <clears throat> to me, the sign of a real trade, a real tradesman, is that they still want to bring their master in and impress them. Most people want to, especially 
being a millennial, want to move past their masters as soon as possible. <laughs> well, I, I think them. this is a mindset that I, I, I kind of, uh, it comes naturally to me. I mean, cooking professionally, it, it's a mentoring business. You know, there are no written recipes, really. Um, the, the way you learn is somebody takes you under their wing and they, they show you how to do the thing again and again and again. And that goes back, um, you know, back when you had medieval guilds, um, most crafts were intergenerational. You know, one, one generation would teach to the next and the next and the next. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 or, or in the case of uh, just making sushi, for instance, uh, that whole sort of a master apprentice system where, you know, they let you work rice until you get it right. You know, maybe that's gonna take three years, four years before you're allowed to touch the fish. Um, Something about that speaks to me. You know, I like I like the obsessive pursuit of excellence. It's not something that I necessarily adhere to <laughs> for most of my life, but it's something I admire. And what's interesting about laziness? Not much. Uh, it, it, you know, what's interesting about laziness is its uh, seduction and its uh, its ever present uh, power to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's always a little voice in my head yeah. saying. Come on, you know, sit down. You know, the Simpsons are on. One you know. more episode. One more episode. How does that translate to you and and booze? I mean, in reading about you a little bit, you're you're definitely much more of a brown liquor kind of guy. You're not much of a sort of crafts beerman, and you don't care that much about knowing everything about the wine list, right? Yeah, I. You know, if it takes you longer to describe what I'm drinking than it does for me to drink it, then it's basically a problem for me. Uh, I. I I like good craft beers. Uh, I like good uh, good wine, but I don't. I don't need to hear the entire story while I'm trying to inspire a, a pleasant uh, but reasonable derangement of the senses. You know, I'm. I, I don't go to bars to taste twelve different beers and write notes down in a notebook. I appreciate a good craft beer, for instance. I appreciate a good whiskey, obviously. I appreciate a, a good wine, but uh, there's a pedantic. Uh, uh, judgmentalism that comes with that, you know, some, you know, some, uh, you know, neck beard uh, yelling at me about uh, <laughs> my my ch my ch choice of beer and trying to make me feel bad because you know I'm drinking a commercially available one which is easily at hand and cold compared to the you know the the craft stuff down the street. Um, you know, I I think that's unreasonable. People should. You, you know, you shouldn't make people feel bad about uh, their food choices uh, unless they're eating at Johnny Rockets. And how much do you want to, how much do you want to talk about a craft beer when you're at a bar having drinks with friends? I want to drink a craft beer yeah, when I'm at a bar. A I don't want to be good. told. You know, I always feel this like I don't. You know, I don't. There are some you know really nasty commercial beers that I don't. I don't drink, but I almost feel compelled to order them. Um, if, if they're giving me attitude, like, why aren't you drinking the, you know, the Dave Matthews pumpkin lager? I'm like, come on, man. It's, <laughs> it's interesting, people talk about craft beers, craft cheeses, craft foods, but when you dig down deeper, they're actually not that handcrafted at all. They may be made in a garage somewhere in a small scale production, but there's a lot of chemicals involved. I'm not saying this about beers, for example, but they may be not that handcrafted, so there's a, a debate about what actually is handcrafted nowadays. Is it heritage? Is it the number of years the men making it, women making it, have been doing it. So what is handcrafted? You know, it's, it's an ongoing debate. You, you go to the, the, the uh, Balvini distillery and it's, you know, it's, it's nuts. It's like you're stepping back into the 19th century. There are people like raking malt and the copper works and people banging away at barrels. It's like, you know, uh, like elves. You know, it's, uh, how, it's how, magic. How difficult is that for Balvini to sort of maintain as a, as a company, to sort of maintain this sort of... Uh, Sorry, not authenticity. <laughs> a respect for hand, for hand craftsmanship. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Respect for hand craftsmanship because at Balvenie, some of these guys have been there 40, 50 years. And the, the Cooperage, for example, is two kids just started when they're 18, 19. And their grandfathers were Coopers before them. So passing on that skill is very important. Tony's talking about mentorship and apprenticeship. is really important. And we value that. So passing on the skills is very important. Um, so there is a lot of skill and a lot of time also. We talk about what is craftsmanship. I think it's also the passage of time and patience. And it's one of the episode we're going to see tonight. I'll just close a wee tip. They're talking about the shoes. It takes 30 months to make the shoes tonight. We're going to talk about they only make 30 a year. Um, the whiskey takes 12 years at least to make. So there's a lot of time and patience goes into craftsmanship as well. It, it makes 12, it takes 12 years to make. It shouldn't take you that long to describe it if I'm drinking it. And I think that's one of the nicest whiskey 
uh, you know, if, in my experience, whiskey distillers in general, I mean, I've spent time with the uh, malt master and people who, uh, who worked at the distillery, and we went out for a few drams afterwards. And, you know, it's a pretty interesting story behind some of this stuff, but they weren't, you know, going on and on about it. They give you the name, the year, you know, if you want to know more, we can talk later, but it's, that's not this... My job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we'd be happy to, but, but uh, you know, it, this is to be enjoyed. When, you did you re when did you realize that you were a whiskey guy? Um, I think uh, generally in times of uh, stress, uh, I start drinking whiskey when I'm feeling, you know, sentimental, uh, either bad about the world or good about the world. Uh, generally... Like four o'clock in the afternoon at an old man bar is the perfect time for me to be drinking whiskey. I like to get, it's a drink that makes me philosophical. You know, it's not like boo hoo party kind of a thing. No, I wanna, I wanna sit down at an old man bar, watch the dust motes floating in the, in the fading light coming through the window, maybe, you know, put some Tom Waits on the jukebox and well, there are put things in perspective. There are different kinds of old man bars in New York City at four o'clock in the afternoon. What kind of old man bar are you referring to? Uh, one where nobody recognizes me, and if they did, they're either too drunk or could care less. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's, uh, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a luxury that I really enjoy, sitting so like there. Just, the old Mars bar or something, that kind of old man uh, bar. Yeah, or, uh, well, let's see, uh, what's the one I like? The Macomba Lounge is a good one. Oh, right. uh, there was one, there were a couple on Ted. Look, it's a dying uh, institution, mm -hmm. you know. There's a, like a, the old man bar, or like kind of dive bars in New York that, City? That, a genuine dive bar. Right. You know, not, not a hipster sort of recreation of a dive bar. Uh, not a post, not a post ironic dive bar, you know, a real dive bar, you know. Come on in, we got cheese balls. Like that yeah, kind of dive bar. <laughs> yeah, no TV, right. you know, a surly bartender. I think that's a must. Uh, if you order a drink with, you know, a, a cocktail with more than two components, you, you know, they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey soda, that's it, man. Like, Jack and Coke, get uh, out of here. I used to love the old Siberia bar that was on the subway on uh, Broadway and 50th and, Street. And that's where you met the guy that uh, makes the suit, right? Uh, indeed. In the Siberia bar. Um, you know, I remember I went in with somebody, he ordered a screwdriver, and the, the, the bartender said, wait a minute, what? And he said, you know, orange juice and vodka. And orange juice and vodka together in a glass. <laughs> Piss off, man. That... <laughs> He said, this is a serious drinking bar. You know, take that shit down the street. <laughs> In Scotland, they frown at you if you ask for ice. It's like... Yeah, I know. I worry about this. Because I do, uh, you know, maybe if it's a 30-year, uh, I'm going to, I'm very aware of the fact that, you know, all eyes are on me. <laughs> Not, but um, every once in a while, I will take one cube in, in a good in a good scotch and a good whiskey, and I can almost hear the intake of breath from all the Scottish dudes I've been working with lately. They're all like, <gasps> you know, like oh, oh. <laughs> That's one of those things. It's, it's, it's hard if you're not used to whiskey neat. Even sometimes the best whiskey's neat. If you're not used to that, it can be, it can be difficult for someone who's drinking it. Oh. I mean, I, for one, usually take ice in my whiskey, but this is smooth and, and beautiful. I, yeah, I it's wouldn't not be to, it's this not at all. To, it's to open it up and, and let the flavor bloom in such a way as to expose it to more popples of the tongue simultaneously, thereby allowing you to enjoy it better. This would be my argument against the, you know, angry Scottish dudes coming at me over this issue. But, I mean, some people actually suggest that, or just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of water. I want to go back to something that uh, I think it was my first question for you about, and it goes back to being obsessed with things that are handcrafted and people enjoying uh, nicer restaurants now that are a wider breadth of the culture enjoying nicer restaurants now. Do you think there is a movement or at the very least a sort of tide changing in the culture away from sort of the boomer ideal of the microwave dinner and the very quick cheap beer to a sort of different culture that embraces things that may take a little longer, may cost a little more, but are overall better for it? your body taste better and the planet? Uh, I think so. I mean, people think Am I just more... just being hopeful? No, no, I think um, certainly in the room we're sitting right now and in many of the places that are probably comfortable to us, those things, we have the luxury of making those things a priority. Um, and of course, that, tri that point of view does trickle down uh, everywhere. Um, but yes, I think people think now, I mean, I've seen it in my career as a chef, people think now about where their food comes from, right. uh, how it was sourced, they know a lot more about the, the dishes put in front of them, they have higher expectations 
they have uh, the chef, uh, the cooks have become empowered uh, or elevated in status in such a way that we, we actually care about the opinion of the person who cooked the food. We see that as a valid you know, uh, opinion worth, worth the knowing. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, you, you see that at every level, at the supermarket, uh, in restaurants, um, and I think that's a, a, a good thing. Um, I think that's also due in part, not to commend you too much, but I think that's due in part to the rise in popularity of personalities like yourself, who have sort of built careers off of showcasing what can be done in a kitchen in different parts of the world, showcasing different parts of the world through food and now through, and now craftsmanship through this series as well. I don't know. I just think in many ways, you know, you have to credit people like Emeril as well. I mean, uh, whatever you thought of uh, his show, the fact that, you know, Emeril was a chef, a recognizable, likable personality, he, he put a face on a previously faceless creature. Uh, so that, that helped also. Uh, this this uh, celebrity chef phenomena, however absurd and bizarre its many manifestations, has on balance, I think, uh, been a positive thing for society. I mean, it's paying off for me. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel when someone calls you a celebrity chef? Like, if we had introduced you, I'd be like, and celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain is here. Uh, you know, it's marginally better than, you know, arsonist or, you know, <laughs> por pornographer. I don't know. It's a... Marginally, though. <laughs> uh, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Who has questions out there? Hey, guys. Hello. Uh, cheers. Um, so I was wondering, like, do you have any favorite uh, drink and food pairings that you like to uh, have? Drink and food pairings? I like to, you know, generally speaking, uh, liquor first, move on to food, either with beer or wine, and then back to liquor. <laughs> you know, I mean, especially right. whiskey. You know, I mean, there are some pairings. Wild game, I think whiskey's, uh, this, this would pair well with, well, look, it's whiskey from Scotland. I think it's best, in my opinion, it's best enjoyed with uh, traditional Scottish ingredients, you know. Uh, Scottish game, uh, some strong Scottish cheese. Those would, be, those would be some good options. But in a perfect world, I would, might have, uh, you know, I might have a whiskey before the meal, drink a little wine with the meal, and then afterwards perhaps return to the whiskey. It's just my, my preference. That's about right, yeah. Lauren? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Scottish cheese is beautiful with whiskey. Uh, dare I say it, haggis? <laughs> awesome stuff, dude. You know, it's, it's awesome, and I like it in all of its many permutations. If you haven't had, like, haggis with curry, deep-fried haggis with curry sauce, you are missing out. And if I fed it to you, you would have no idea what it was. You would say it was delicious. And then you would become incredibly disturbed afterwards when I told <laughs> yes. you that you'd just eaten it. We won't disclose what's in it, but haggis, uh, Scottish cheddar, I think, I love with, with well, any whiskey, yeah, for sure. So, but basically, how anyone could sneer at haggis, you know, they're eating a hot dog while sneering at haggis. It's like, dude, you know what's in that? <laughs> uh, next question. Hey, Anthony, I'm helping my mom with Thanksgiving, and I want to know um, if you have any tips so, so I can impress her. Uh, yes, in... Uh, Funnily, you should, funny enough, you should ask, because in my new cookbook, Appetites, just yeah. released last week, there it is. the perfect stocking stuffer, Father's Day gift, and <laughs> doorstop, uh, there is like a, an entire chapter dedicated to how to strategically prepare Thanksgiving so that you, A, won't screw it up, B, will actually have fun, and not find yourself, you know, wrestling with a turkey or causing a, you know, the murder rate spike around... Thanksgiving and Christmas, and a lot of that, I believe, is because of, uh, you know, improper, like, planning and preparation for Thanksgiving. So uh, I, I break down how to basically spread your work over three stress-filled, stress-free days so that when your guests show up, you look like a genius, you look like you've done everything last minute, but you, you serve a ballistically and strategically perfect Thanksgiving dinner uh, that hews to the traditional flavors, and you will actually be able to spend time with your guests because, you know, as I have learned, you do not want to be in there in the kitchen do struggling or hopping up and down from the table where you're, you know, your, your guests are sitting there drinking on an empty stomach, you know, minute after minute, hour after hour, getting, you know, bitter and angry and drunk, and that sort of thing can lead to senseless butchery. Especially in an election year, you don't want that. You don't want that at all. But I recommend, if at all possible, getting what doing what I call a stunt turkey, meaning 
no restaurants. I've served hundreds and hundreds of Thanksgiving meals over the years. And what we always used to do is we would, you know, we're not carving turkey off the bone. We, you know, we would break the, down the turkey and, and slice the breasts sort of into, you know, nice shingled, uh, beautiful platters. But we'd have a display turkey for people to look at. It's like, oh, look, it's so pretty. It's all the whole turkey there, all glistening and stuffed. So you make one of those, a small one, and that you use for your leftovers, yes, you know, the next day, which is what Thanksgiving's all about anyway, right? I mean, it's about sitting there in your, your underpants, eating cold turkey the next day, or saying, thank God they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a work turkey to do the slicing, and anyway. Um, next question. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Jessica. I actually just graduated from culinary school. So to say that you are an inspiration is an understatement. Um, I actually have a, fr a question from a friend named oh. Dylan Booth. Okay. Um, and the question is, for years you've encouraged your viewers, readers, listeners, and fans to get lost, explore the unknown, and in all senses of the word, approach the world with an open mind. And without risk, there is rarely a reward. So can you tell us any tales when you've stumbled into the amazing and or terrible experiences through this, through this journey? <laughs> um, I use an example often um, about, being in the, about the perfect meal. And I was in the Caribbean many, many years ago with, uh, with a girlfriend and we were uh, headed off to the beach and, uh, on a motor scooter and it started pouring rain and we found ourselves in this little you know, muddy shanty town, unpaved roads, uh, looked over the only shelter available as the rain is coming down is this sort of corrugated tin roofed shack and a guy standing there in a filthy looking apron grilling I don't even know what over, uh, you know, like one of those uh, uh, 55 gallon drums sawed in half and went in, sat down, uh, ordered that turned out to be chicken leg. Um, there's a mangy looking dog running around on the floor, nipping at our heels. Uh, the rain is coming down on this roof like machine gun fire. But I'll tell you, uh, suddenly just, you know, a song that I really liked happened to come on the radio. The beer, it was like a red stripe, was like super cold, just what I needed. And that at the time, because of who I was with and the combination of the music and the fact that we accidentally found ourselves in this absurd, you know, frightening, yet oddly, perfectly Thai moment. That was the best goddamn chicken in the world, ever, <laughs> you know? And, you know, the extent to which you allow moments like that to happen is uh, make it more likely. Of course, you're gonna, you spin the wheel long enough, you're gonna have a bad meal. Um, but you're much more likely to have that really once in a lifetime magical one if you open yourself up to the possibility or even the likelihood that you'll have a disappointing one. If you stick with an agenda, you're never gonna, have that. If you ask the concierge at the hotel, ain't gonna happen. I mean, particularly you go to a place like Rome or Venice, the overwhelming likelihood is that you're gonna have a bad meal there. I mean, it's shocking in a place like Rome, Venice, you think there's great food everywhere. I can but, testify to Rome. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you just wander, and if you, as long as you know, if you just go in any place where you see nothing but like scary looking cranky Romans eating by themselves or in twos, no other Americans, no menu with the, in the English, no pictures of the food, those are all warning signs. You know, you have a good shot at stumbling into that, that, that like how the hell did I find this? This is so awesome, it's so perfect that I stumbled into this magical experience. What was the song? Do you remember? Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed because it was a Roxy Music, uh, early Roxy Music song. I think it was more than this, actually. Why would you yeah. be embarrassed by that? It's a great song. Uh, it's kind of cheesy, but yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, there, that, that era of Roxy Music really has a wonderful True. place. True. No, I mean, I still listen to them. I Especially love them. Especially for a moment like that, I think. That would be... That's it amazing. was very romantic. Um, I have to let the, the two of you go. Uh, Raw Craft can be seen uh, on, 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 a, on YouTube, right? The, yep. Bob yep. any US rock, rock craft channel. Appetize, Appetites is out in stores now. Indeed. And I believe you can pick up a wonderful bottle of Belvini in, in a liquor store. Yeah, near most you, liquor right? stores have the Belvini, yep. All right. Guys, Have thanks so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you.